All right, Laura, thank you so much for being here with me today. You and I have never met before. This yeah. is this is the first time we've met and I just appreciate you. I'm I'm, you know, I I need a passion project. It used to be this, but now I do this for a job. So, now I need something else. So I'm really on this mission to increase awareness and decrease stigma and just get people's stories. I think just sharing stories, stories, stories is just a really great way to connect the community and so that we don't feel so alone. We, we identify. And so I appreciate you being willing to be here with me today. Yes. So, yay. Well, I was wondering if you'd go ahead and introduce yourself to our viewers. Yes. So um, my name is Laura Lively. Um, I have been... Um, I have been overweight since I was three years old. So was, uh, and I'm 56. And so for me, food has been an issue. Alcohol became an issue in my forties. Um, but for me, food was just, uh, it was, not, it was a nightmare. Like you had prepped me with some questions, like, what was it like before you started recovery? You asked. And I was like, it was basically 50 years of hell. That's what it was. That's what it was like. Um, and I came to recovery. I remember the first time I went to a, I went to a 12 step program when I was probably 18 or 19, I walked in and walked right out. I was like, that is never happening. Right. I am never doing sugar or flour. That's crazy with OA. And, um, but also around the same time as the first time I tried a weight loss plan. And so the first time I purposely went to, uh, try to lose weight was with Weight Watchers. Like a lot of people, that's their first stop. And um, I weighed 297 and three quarters. And it was three quarters because it was back in those, back in the old day, for those of us old enough to remember those old, uh, ch -ch -ch, right, um, on the scale. So it was 297 and three quarters. And I was horrified. I'm 5'5". Five five, so I was, actually, I was 5'4". I've actually gained an inch after I lost some weight, which was interesting. Um, and that was a lot of weight. I mean, I was wearing size 24s and women's. Um, and I lost the weight and I, I lost it. I got down to 166 and I, I was in college and men started paying attention to me and I panicked and that started a basically math's never been my friend, but that was like a third, that became a 30 year cycle of just up and down and up and down um, through the rest of my life. And, you know, my, I, it, it, I tried, like everybody, I tried everything twice. Um, I even, and this is how alcohol became part of my story. In my forties, I was using exercise to stay below 200 and I tore the labrum in my right hip, which is a very painful um, injury. And now today in 2022, if, if you tore the labrum in your hip, in a lot of cases, it can be fixed laparoscopically. But at the time when I did it in my forties, that wasn't the case there. It was your options are grin and bear it or have a hip replacement. And because I was in my forties, they were like, no, I mean, nobody, I lived in a major metropolitan city. I actually, have, I move around a lot. I've moved around a lot in my life. I had in Minneapolis. They're like, I mean, I was going to the same place that the Minneapolis Vikings go. Right. And they're like, no, you don't want to have a hip replacement because if you have a hip replacement, they're only good for 25 years. You're just going to have to do it again. And I bought into that because I didn't want the hip replacement. I moved to the Bay Area in California, see a doctor. Nope, you don't want it. Hip replacement, blah, blah, blah. Same thing I got in Minneapolis. I moved back to Oklahoma, which is where I'm originally from because my parents were needing um, some more support. And I go to a, a surgeon in Tulsa and, and the guy's like, you're not guaranteed another 50 years. Like, why would we wait? Like, this is stupid. And, um, but unfortunately after, but that was like, 10 years later, or like, you know, eight to 10 years later. And unfortunately, the only thing that would touch the pain, no, no opioids would touch the pain, pot would not touch the pain, uh, over the counter, what, you know what did? Wine. For whatever reason, wine stopped the pain. And I ended up becoming a functioning alcoholic because it was the only way I did not have pain. Um, so now I can't exercise any longer. I am now drinking to stop pain. And um, in October of 2016, um, I was fat shamed on a plane. This old white guy so tells the flight attendant, I won't fit next to her. Well, I would point out that he did fit next to me. Um, and then I went to the doctor on October, or excuse me, November 30th. 
and I weighed 302 and I had never seen 300 before and I'm still in miserable pain. There's, I don't know what I can do. And, um, and another thing that, and thankfully for me, bright line eating, which I know you guys have, or at least on your podcast, which by the way, I said this to you before we started recording your podcast has been so helpful to me, um, in my journey. And it's really helping take my healing to the next level now. Um, but in 2016, I was as miserable as I could possibly be. I couldn't move because of pain. I'm now an alcohol functioning, I'm a high functioning alcoholic. I weigh over 300 pounds and bright line eating fell into my inbox and, um, I listened to it and it was based on OA, which, you know, I had lasted a hot second in OA when I was in my twenties and with the BLE with bright line eating or BLE, um, I knew it would never work. What I saw, I signed up, I did the math, like, okay, well, you could be in Weight Watchers for X number of years, or at that time it was pretty spendy. It was an, a spendy program. I don't think it's that expensive anymore, but um, I did all this math and calculations about, you know, what's it going to cost versus not cost. And um, I decided, and I put it in my, and then I saw the program, the food program and realized it was OA basically, or, a, you know, a version of a 12 step. And I was like, oh, hell no, this will never work. And so I put 30 days to get my money back in the calendar. And I can say, I have never been so glad to be wrong in my entire life. And what was interesting was back in 2009, I became gluten intolerant or no longer able to eat wheat in the United States. Uh, it's funny, I could go to Europe and eat wheat, would not get sick, not have physical manifestations. And there's all sorts of arguments and discussions around that. But, um, and I remember in 2009 saying, gosh, if I was just allergic to sugar, I'd be skinny as a rail because, and this was before gluten-free was a thing, right? So I never really thankfully introduced a ton of gluten-free things into my life. I just stopped, I intended to eat more whole foods. So Fast forward, we're back in 20, January, 2017. I joined Brightline Eating. I know this will never work. This is a bunch of crap. And um, the first two weeks were hard, like no sugar, no flour, weigh in, measure your meals, only eat at specified, don't, no snacking basically. Like if you need to eat four meals, great. If you need to eat three meals, great, but just no snacking, just make a decision and follow the rules, right? Um, and probably within the first couple of, I remember the first couple of weeks, I was like, oh, I remember this from when I had to come off gluten, like the, the, the nausea and the, um, and the, you know, the exhaustion and all of the withdrawal basically from the sugar. And I, within a couple of weeks though, what I noticed was I was actually happy and I didn't know the last time, like, I'm driving to the grocery store, which I always hated going to the grocery store and I'm humming, <laughs> singing, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, who are you? And what is happening here? And it was so funny. My sister who um, has different sorts of eating issues than me, she actually also was overweight as a child, but when she hit 18 and went to Weight Watchers, she actually managed to keep her, the bulk of her weight off all of her life. But she has very different food issues, but definitely food issues. So she's on the phone with me. She's like, who are you? And what have you done with my sister? And I'm like, I know, right? This is not me. And so she also joined BLE um, and lost like the last 20 pounds and has also kept it off. So again, in my head is, you know, this is now we're moving into the end of 2017. Um, I'm losing weight. I am happy. The pain in my hip is a less because I've got less weight on it. Um, but I've got a, a thing in my head paying attention because I know that anytime I get over under 200, I will panic and put the weight back on. And so I'm just waiting because history has shown that this has been the case. So luckily for me, right line eating introduced internal family systems into their model, which is a healing modality that is taught to therapists and non-therapists um, by the internal family systems Institute. Um, and I, started seeing an internal family systems practitioner. So what we believe in internal family systems is that we are all multiples. We believe, you know, and if those of you that are of an age that uh, like I am, that remember Sybil, that could be a frightening thought. Like, are you trying to tell me I'm Sybil? Are you telling me I'm crazy? And it's like, well, in the case of Sybil, which used to be called 
um, multiple personality disorder and is now called dissociative identity disorder. Um, yes, we do believe we all have parts. We all have different identities inside of us. But in the case of DID, they're blown so far apart that they don't recognize that they're in the same person. But you know, ways that this is really easy for a lot of people to grasp is, I don't know, the angel and the devil on your shoulder, right? The angel says, don't eat that brownie, Lara. Your pants are already tight. The devil's like, eat it, eat it, eat it, right? In some ways I explain it um, are, I don't know, particularly in the advent of streaming TV these days, you know, you start watching something on a television show and then 10 seconds later, here it comes. And now is another one. And the next thing you know, it's like three hours later, right? And you're like, and I'll hear, I'll hear a voice in my head say, get off the couch and go do something productive for crying out loud, Lara. You have been laying here for three bloody hours. What is wrong with you, right? And then I get another voice that's like, oh no, we've got to know what happens to Joe next. You can't get off the couch, right? Like, and you hear, and this is really common. We have these competing voices and thoughts in our heads and so in internal family systems, we believe that is all normal. And all of those parts of us are trying to help us. They're trying to do the best that they can. So, um, oh, and like I always like to say, we are not just a big bag of parts. Like at our core, we have self energy. We have the ability to be calm and compassionate and courageous and um, curious about what's going on with all these voices in our heads. So. Okay, if we go back into 2017, I uh, again, BLE introduced IFS into their model and I started, I went and found an IFS practitioner and I saw like amazing changes in my internal world and how I dealt with life within like 30 to 45 days. Now, obviously I can't guarantee that to anybody, but it, it made such a huge difference in my life that I decided to get I, IFS trained. So I am now an IFS practitioner myself. And what I believe happened, and, and so I have now in October, November of 2018, I went into maintenance in a food program. And so I've been in maintenance and been in a, a you know, a normal size, right sized, you know, body for the last four, almost four years. We're coming up on four years. And I believe it was the sugar. If you were going to ask me like, why, what happened this time? What made it different? I would say three things. One was the sugar. I had no idea. And I'm lucky that I have a physical and emotional reaction to sugar. When I, if I accidentally get to it or on purpose, get into it, I'm a crazy person. I am so emotionally reactive. I get, tr everything triggers me. I can't, I'm crying. I am yelling. I am, I'm an unhappy girl. And so, and I'm grateful for that because I, I'm grateful because that helps me stay out of it because I know I am almost useless if I eat sugar. So I'm grateful for the reaction to the sugar. Um, so the lack of sugar, um, gluten and flour wasn't that hard for me because I'd kind of given it up in 2009. So I would say the lack of sugar, doing the emotional work that I did with internal family systems. And I always tell people like, if you want to do BLE, do it. If you want to do keto, do it. If you want to do, you know, if you want to do talk therapy, do it. If you want to do EMDR, do it, whatever. But to me, that inner work, whatever works for you is critical because I wasn't eating, you know, I didn't weigh 300 pounds because I like my grandma's peach pie. Like I am using that food to stuff down my emotions because I don't know how to manage all of the things that have happened to me or are happening to me. And so doing that emotional work was critical. So sugar, the emotional work. And then finally finding a community because when I weighed 300 pounds and was miserable, I thought I was the only person in the world, right? I did not, I wasn't, I thought it was just me that was crazy. I thought it was just me that didn't know how to manage their food. And so the other lovely thing about, again, again, not pushing BLE, but one thing that was lovely is they created a community where I found that I was not alone that there were tons of people that had the same problems I had. And I can just meet somebody. And, and now, uh, you know, again, loving finding you guys, find, finding a community of people that understand what sugar does to people, that is a gift. So those are the three things that I would tell you. Um, you know, life was hell before recovery. And the three things that really made a difference were for me to get off the sugar. Um, I don't eat flour either, but I don't think flour impacts me quite the way 
or gluten-free flour doesn't impact me quite the way the sugar does. Finding community and then doing the inner work to understand why I did the things I did and then learning new coping mechanisms. Uh, and in my case, it was learning how to manage the parts of me with some self-energy to understand you know, why they were doing the things they were doing. So that's kind of my story in a quasi nutshell. No, that's great. You had mentioned that, you know, those first two weeks were pretty difficult because you were having to stick to the bright lines, which are these guidelines, right? That is what, like no sugar, no flour, weighed and measured, and then timed meals, right? Those yeah. are the four bright lines. That's right. So in that like more difficult time period, because you're doing something brand new, you're withdrawing, you know, all of those things, how did you stick with it? Like, did you was it that, okay, 30 days money, money back guarantee? How did, did, did you rely on the community? Like, how did you stick with it That's through hilarious. that painful time period? That's a great question. Um, that's a great question. You know, I think there is something to be said for how miserable I was. Like I was at rock bottom. I was in so much pain and so desperate. And I also think there is something to be said, at least at first with anything you try is that ability to, you know, stick to it for a while. Right. To me, um, it, and there was community, the community was there so that when I could say, oh my gosh, I, you know, I feel like hell and I, I need to go to bed at two in the afternoon and people be like, do what you need to do, take care of yourself. I mean, so there was, I think community was probably the biggest, but I also do think that in a lot of us, we do have enough willpower to get us through the first little bit of whatever. To me, the danger became months later when it's no longer new and shiny. And, um, and now I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, I really use food to deal with my emotions and I can't do that anymore. Now, what the heck am I supposed to do? So to me, the danger time came later after the new and shiny had worn off. But I, it, but to answer your question, really having that community of people, um, they recommend that you have a buddy. They recommend that you have a mastermind group um, that we met, we meet, and we still do to this day. Even even though not everybody has stayed on Brightline eating, we still meet. So these these women mean a lot to me. So having that community was probably the most critical thing. And so when you needed to lean in, when you needed to do that deeper work, you had the wherewithal or the, the desire, or, I mean, I don't know what, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but mm -hmm. something you were like, it cannot continue this way. That's exactly. I was in such a bad place. I was such in such a horrible headspace. I was physically in a bad space. I was mentally, it was just all bad. And I remember at one point, I, I am not at, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with this, but for me, it was like, I said to my husband, it's this or bariatric surgery. And I had a part in me. I now recognize it was a part that just the idea of cutting off an organ was not something I could do, but I was desperate enough. And I will say, having said that, there's been multiple times in the past I've said that, okay, I'm going to try this or it's bariatric surgery. I'm going to try this or, but I just could not do the bariatric surgery. And I, I realized finally it's going to kill you. It is absolutely going to kill you. Cause you know, I've been overweight all my life. So my health was not neg negatively impacted until I hit my forties. And suddenly I actually turned 40 years old and within six months, like my thyroid died. I was suddenly in horrible knee joint pain. Um, and I was probably and that was when I was like, holy crap, we've, you know, something's got to give. And so I really feel like I was just really at rock bottom, um, at least as it relates to food. My alcohol story is a little weirder, but um, I, I was desperate and desperation can make you do lots of things, I feel like. And how does the alcohol play in here? Ooh. Because you were still drinking when you started BLE. Yes, 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 I was. And um, they, you know, so in bright light eating, they're very clear that alcohol is sugar and therefore no, no. And, um, and so I, I was perfect for whatever that means. Right. I, I did not drink through what they called boot camp at that time. I think it was an eight or 10 week program. But then after that, I decided I was going to be the one person that could drink on bright light eating. And so Memorial day of 2017 rolled around and I had my first drink and then on, on and off all summer. Um, it, 
I would have a drink here and there, like 4th of July, I'd have a drink. My birthday was in June, I had a drink. Our anniversary was in June, I had a drink. And what I, know, what I started noticing was that by the middle of July, my weight loss had really um, slowed to a crawl. And, and more importantly, I wasn't happy anymore. I was no longer humming and happy and singing on the way to the um, grocery store anymore. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting. And I remember um, talking to my, to my mastermind group about that. I was like, wow, I think uh, I really, so then I stopped drinking again. So, oh, that's actually not actually accurate. I have a part that tells me whenever I say anything that's even slightly off. In August of that year, 2017, I was at a work function and I got drunk and I was ashamed and embarrassed. And I was like, okay, now we have to swear off. Okay, you've, you've tried this game, your weight's impacted, your happiness is impacted. You've now made a fool of yourself and they could easily fire you. So let's swear this off. So I did. So that was the end of 27, or that was um, Labor Day in the United States in 2017, uh, which is in August, if you guys aren't in the United States. So then I went a whole other year and then in uh, actually maybe two years. And then in 2019, it's, I haven't drank in two years. And I was like, I can probably drink again. I bet you can guess, listeners, you can guess how that went. Um, it, it was horrible. It was the most horrible thing that has ever happened in my life. Um, and I was drunk so fast. It was, oh my gosh, it was horrible. It was horrible. And it scared me so bad that, cause I was out in California I had to fly home completely hung over. Uh, I mean, I'm throwing up on the plane. It was so bad. I went straight to an AA meeting, which um, I came to find out actually. And I have a, I also want to say, I know I, oh, AA has saved so many people's lives and I totally get that. But by this time I was trained in internal family systems and we believe at our core, you know, we have all these parts that want different things, but our core, we have self. And we believe that self is a healing agent in our system. And in AA, there's, a, you know, you have to give, you, you know, there's a lot of conversation about you can't trust yourself. And so I found myself in a kind of push pull between what I believed and saw about internal family systems versus what I was hearing in AA. And, um, so what I did was it was, and I have, as a practitioner, one of the things they always tell you is if you want to have clients, your clients, your, your therapist or your practitioner should be doing their own work. So I have my own IFS therapist. And it, what I, what I found coming up in my system is I had parts saying, why was internal family systems good enough for your food, but not good enough for alcohol. And so I took that kind of like dichotomy to my therapist. And we found parts that were really afraid because, you know, all we've ever heard, like in, in traditional out in the world is AA is the only solution, right? It's the only solution. Um, otherwise you'll be drinking again. And so that was scaring parts of me. And so we actually ended up working with my alcoholic system and it was so interesting. My alcoholic system, there was a part that likes to drink. He happens to be male. Uh, your parts can be any gender. They can be gender neutral. They can be like, I've had a giraffe as a part before that was protective part, but my alcohol part, he was a funny guy. He's very funny. He's, he's like sarcastic and he likes to drink because he likes to drink. And then there were parts that were scared of him, but it was interesting as we dug into that little subsystem of my alcohol system, we found a part and it was the actual frightening part because it believed that if we healed, we could drink. And I was like, that is so interesting. And so we worked with that part and um, we healed it because it had a part it was protecting, which is how parts work works. And um, so we walked away from AA. I have to get my AAs and OAs, right? We walked away from AA um, and I've been sober. Let's see, this, the anniversary of that work thing was 2019 in, in August. And so what is that? August, three years now? So, um, and I, because uh, again, AA does amazing things. I get that um, it has done for lots of people and it just didn't work for me because it really put me at odds with how I had been able to use the inner work that I did with internal family systems to heal 
my food issues. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, and I'm a licensed mental health professional, licensed addiction therapist, you know, and I'm with you in that, like, I fully believe there's no one right way to do this. So has a, a, has, have any of the 12 steps saved that hundreds of thousands of lives over the year, years, you bet. But there are many people that are not joiners is what we call them, right? They're just not joiners. And and not that that's not necessarily right. true for you. I mean, it sounds like you joined BLE and there's this community. And, but I think it's like, we're finding our own way. We find what lines up for us. So for those that, what traditional 12 steps, you know, gives you and that lines up for, then it works for them. But for those people who it doesn't, we find other ways. We, we go with rational recovery or smart recovery or BLE or, you know, Dharma recovery, you know, whatever, like people find their way. And it sounds like you were just being true to you. You, you were listening to that internal dialogue that said, uh, there's something not right here for me. I'm actually, um, there's a group I'm, a board member of a group that we created an internal family systems based recovery group because there, we found that there were enough of us that it didn't work. And IFS is very loving. I mean, I firmly believe that everyone has what they need inside of themselves to heal themselves. And I also love what you just said, you know, what worked for me might not work for you. Go find what works for you. And I love that. Yeah. Um, you know, there's that saying of like, if someone tells you there's one way run away, right. That, oh, I like that. you know, yeah. you know, because I always like to think about it like math or science, you know, we can do the same math problem, but you know, to get to the same answer of eight, you might do two plus six or four plus four or five plus three or one plus seven, right. It still gets the same result. I like that. Right. And, and when we can just stay curious about like, oh, that worked for her. Maybe I'll check that out. Oh, maybe that isn't fully for me, but there are parts of that. Right. You know, there's parts of BLE or parts of IFS or parts of whatever that worked for me. So I just love, I love your story so much. So I'm really wondering what is life like now? Like what is a day in the life of you? If I were a fly on the wall, what would I see you doing? What's it like? Do you have routines? Do you have things that you do to kind of protect what you have? I do. Um, it's interesting. I'm actually kind of fluxing right now in what I'm doing to change my morning routine. But uh, for years, I have had a morning routine. I've got something in my eye that'll break you. I'm glad you said earlier, we don't have to be perfect. Um, I, in the morning, and I protect this when I'm home, which is most of the time, I am the one place in my life I'm very conservative is around COVID. And I have elderly parents live behind me. And so I'm Uh, that I have a lot of comorbidities. And so I'm very careful. So, so when I say when I'm home, that's like 98% of the time. Um, I, I get down on a yoga mat. I do stretching. I write in a five-year journal. And by the way, I know some of this is 12 step because they came from BLE and she picked up a lot of her stuff from a, from 12 step. Um, I write a gratitude list. I found that writing three things that I'm grateful for every day, it changed how my brain worked. And that was something I became aware of when uh, a couple of years ago, we had a really bad hailstorm with like, you know, this kind of hail coming through both of our houses on our property ended up with, you know, damage to everything, the cars, the house, windows broke. It was really, uh, you know, it was an event. And I remember walking outside, looking around afterwards. And I was like, I am so grateful it wasn't worse. And that was like, when the light bulb went on, I'm like, wow something has shifted. And I believe it's because I make a gratitude list every day. And I, I, when I started, I have, you know, I had to write down a cheat sheet because, you know, at first, if you're not used to thinking about things that way, if you're, you know, our brains, as you know, are wired to be looking for trouble, trouble, trouble. Um, And I had a cheat sheet. So if I had to write down my husband and my cats and my parents still being with us, that's what I used. But over time, I didn't need the cheat sheet. I could think of, oh, this happened today. And I'm so grateful that occurred. So I, my gratitude list has changed so much of my life. And then I also, um, spirituality has always been hard for me. I think one of the reasons that OA, AA, et cetera, were hard for me is I did not have a higher power. I did not grow up going to a church. Um, I went to a church when I was in college, because I was in love with a boy, of course, wrong reason, but that's what, that, that, there it is. Um, and then I walked away when I began to realize, uh, hopefully this is not too controversial, 
just how patriarchal that the church was and that there were you know, there were books that got put into a Bible and books that were left out of a Bible. And suddenly my skeptical parts were like, hold on a second. Um, and so I walked away from a church. Also in the United States, um, there has been a lot of co-opting of Christianity for political reasons. And I found that very unappealing. And so I, you know, did a lot of like, unfortunately getting rid of the baby with the bathwater. So in the last year, I have really been focused on how do I, I do believe there's something greater than us. And I've really spent the last year focusing on what that is. And so I started adding in some routines that are helping in the morning. So this is how it's kind of in flux, adding in some spiritual, but not necessarily religious readings into my life every morning. You know, they're not long, but it's enough to give me pause and to have me think throughout the day. Um, and so that's something that I've added in. I also sit down and journal. Life has been like, Susan Pierce Thompson says this, life is lifey and life has been lifey the last couple of weeks and will be for a couple more weeks in my world. And so I've started by, um, I'm just writing down the parts that jump up, you know, the part that's telling me, you know, why did you do that yesterday? Got it. Uh, you know, oh my gosh, don't forget we need to do X, Y, Z today. Thank you. Got it. So I start listing the parts that are active. And by the way, if I don't, if for your listeners, parts can be thoughts, emotions, memories, um, you know, just whatever's happening in our head and dumping them out on paper helps. It helps from a couple of ways. One is the parts feel seen and heard. And then the other way is that it gives me some separation so that I can kind of see what's going on. And then, then it's not rolling in my head, right? I mean, you know, people conventional wisdom is if you got a thought rolling in your head, write it down, send yourself a text and that'll make it stop. That's true. Right. So I've added that, like just doing kind of a, a kind of a dump on the day before. So that's, that's how I start my morning. Um, I make my, I have a chia pudding for breakfast. And so I make that the night before, um, I have breakfast, I see clients, um, I have lunch, I take a walk. I used to take it in the morning when it was warmer or yeah, when it was warmer. Now I take a walk in the afternoon. I come home. See, if I have clients, I see them. I have my dinner. Uh, I do have somebody come in and help me prep food. They come in and do a bunch of batch cooking for me. Actually, they're doing it right now as we speak um, so that I've got components ready so that it's easy for me to grab my vegetables, grab my protein, um, weigh and measure it when I need it. So that is one thing that I've allowed myself that is amazing to have that kind of help. Um, then at night, for the first year in Brightline eating, because we would eat and drink at night. That was what my husband and I did together. We ate and drank together while we're watching TV as soon as dinner was over, right? And um, so for the first year, I dived in the bathtub every night. Like, so my kitchen was closed. I dived in the bathtub. And so that has become my sanctuary. So again, when I'm home, sometimes in the middle of the afternoon, a part will be like, if it's three o'clock and, you know, little inner like, can we get in the bathtub yet? Can we go read our book yet? And it's like, no, sweetheart. No, not yet. A couple more hours. And then we can do that. So that's how my evening ends up. The, my parts, my whole system all day long looks forward to, oh, we get to get in the bathtub and read. That's our happy place. Um, and I guess the other thing, and then I'm in bed by nine or 9.30 max, because to me, sleep is my number one self-care uh, routine. If I don't sleep, I am shot. It's almost as bad as me eating sugar if I'm not sleeping. So um, that's what a day in the life looks like. I had somebody, I was talking to somebody, they're like, oh, it sounds like you live a pretty simple life. And a part did not like that word simple, but the more I think about it, I'm like, it's true. And I'm happy. Um, I always like, if I'm talking to potential clients, they're like, oh, how's life changed for you? I'm always like, you should actually talk to my husband. He could tell you, I am not the woman he married. And he's very great. I mean, he loved me anyway, because he, this is the one thing I will say for him. He loved me no matter what I weighed. So that's a good man, but I'm not the person I used to be. And I am so grateful, but yeah, that's it. Day in a life. Um, on Fridays, I allow myself to watch some TV in the evening. Cause I normally don't have, I normally try to keep Fridays clear so I can watch some TV, okay. not because I can, but just that's like the breakdown time. You know, that's like the, ah, oh, we're mm -hmm. done. Yeah. So yeah. that's it. That's what it looks yeah. like. Well, I mean, you bring up a really great point. So when people say like, how is life different now? And you say, ask my husband, he'd be able to tell you. And obviously we know this isn't just about weight. I mean, if this was just about weight, Weight Watchers would have worked years ago. Um, this is about so much more. And so, you know, you would have initially said, okay, life 
pre-recovery was hell. I mean, how would you describe it now? What is life like now? I'd like to get up and do a happy dance for you. Um, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot and, you know, this is where I'm at in my journey. I, th I think I said this to you on tape. Um, I have a part, a part of me does not like the word addict. Okay. It, or maybe I didn't, but a part of me does not like that word addict. Cause I feel like, because, because I recognize I have parts. Yes. Do I have a part that's an alcoholic? Yes. hundred percent. Do I have a part that, um, cannot eat sugar without drama? hundred percent. But I am more than that. And I have tons of parts. Those are only small parts of who I am. So having said that, it's been hard for me to embrace that term addict, being an addict, being an alcoholic. I don't, there, I see even now I felt like I can feel it in my body cringing. It really doesn't like that term. So what's kind of happening in my world right now is I'm, I, I'm recognizing that that's a part and I'm curious about why, tell me more about why you don't like that. And, um, tell me more about what that means. And some of the things that I've been doing because of you guys actually, uh, was, uh, Robert Lustig's work. I just was introduced through probably through Vera's book. She may have mentioned him there. And I'm really starting to understand more that the weight is a symptom, not the problem per se of illness. And so I, I know that for all, again, overweight all my life until I was 40 and started having health issues with it. Suddenly the cholesterol is going up. Suddenly the blood pressure is going up. Um, I was probably more like those people that were healthy enough, but I could never embrace as an example, body positivity. I was never happy. I always had shame. And so I've been, as I'm, as I'm continuing to refine my own understanding of what this journey has been like, you know, one of the things you see the internet memes, oh, when I, you know, when I get the new house, I'll be happy. When I get promoted, I'll be happy. When I lose 20 pounds, I'll be happy. When I get the new car, I'll be happy, right? You're never happy. That's what they say, right? But actually I am losing the weight. And, and I've been considering why, why is that? And I think part of it was, unfortunately, the world we live in is made for skinny people, even though skinny people are not the norm, particularly in the United States, like for cost cutting purposes, chairs in airplanes getting smaller, right? Like movies, they've recently, movie theater seats are different now. They're making them bigger, but previously movie theater seats were smaller. Um, concert seats are small. I couldn't get on, I couldn't get on to save my life a roller coaster. Because when that bar comes down, I'm going to have bruises on my belly from where it hurts. You know, um, it's hard for when I weighed 300 pounds, it was hard for me to reach my steering wheel in my car. I'm having to move my gut around. The world that we currently live in is made for smaller people, for good or for ill. It just is. And so I was just, I was traveling recently for my other job. I have two jobs. And like, I can walk down the aisle of a plane, no issue. I don't have to worry about what, uh, you know, if an airplane, uh, if I'm, do I need, I didn't have to carry my airplane extension thing, Bob, that I had to buy, right? I didn't have to worry that I was going to bump into somebody with my girth. And so the world is just, unfortunately, or for, I guess, depending on your opinion, it's just easier to move through at this weight. And then the flip side is that, so personally, I don't have the aches and pains that I had. I, um, I'll tell you an interesting I was also a Diet Coke aholic, right? I think giving up Diet Coke was actually harder than giving up the wine. And I, I have no idea what caused it, but there was a thing, um, I don't remember, I don't know the scientific name, but a lot of people have on the backs of their arms, this thing that feels like they call it chicken skin, is, but there's a scientific name, Polaris something, I don't know. That went away when I was on BLE. And I'm like, totally random. I mean, I had gone to dermatologists about it. They'd given me very expensive cream to slather on, nothing ever worked. And I was like, what the heck was that? Like, what was that? I don't, I still don't know, but I, I know that in the BLE community, I'm not the only person that that went away with. So that made me start to question, what else was it doing in my system? What else was the food that I was eating? I, I can tell you another one, actually. Um, my dad, male pattern baldness, which I know they say comes to your mother, um, her family also, and my hair was thinning very, very thin until BLE. And now suddenly 
I don't have a bald spot anymore. Is it thinner? Yeah, but it's not like it was. And I'm like, how is the food I'm, so I'm starting to, you know, as the years go by, I'm questioning how is the food I'm eating impacting things in my body? I never even occurred to me. Um, but also personally, I'm just happy. I am a happy person. I was never, um, my mother said, bless her heart. She was like, Laura, we had no idea you ever wanted to help people. It's, it never came up like when you were a kid, right? True story. Um, because I was miserable. I was miserable from the time I was three years old. I mean, I came out of corporate America. I did credit card fraud prevention. I mean, fraud about, is about as far away from helping people. Well, it's actually not true. Okay, see a part. It's like, no, that's not true. Fair, I'm gonna let the part speak, but I'm gonna let it have it. Um, I wasn't credit card fraud. I loved it. I got to be Nancy Drew. I think that was great, but it is, you know, it's pretty far away from being able to help people get to know themselves better and help heal all areas of their lives with internal family systems. So everything in my life is different and better. And um, I am happier at this weight than I was when I weighed 300 pounds. Well, yeah, it sounds like it. Like you said, even if it, even if it wasn't about the weight that there were so many other like internal things that we can't see, right. We can't see the pain relief. We can't see the, the brain fog lifted or the mood swings that have leveled or relationships that have improved just because there's no longer this, you know, is he going to stop talking or so I can go get my, whatever, or, right. you know, is he going to go do something else so I can sneak off and get, so whatever, I can you know, go get my next glass of wine. Yeah. yeah. Whatever it might be. Right. So, oh, I just, I love, I love this conversation so much. I do have a final question for you. Um, because I, I just think it's important that we, again, it's in sharing our story that, you know, it's always nice to know, like, what did you need to hear when you were first starting this journey? You know, I thought about that question. Um, it can be done. But, you know, I was talking to a friend the other day about this. Um, and I said, but what was different this time? So I'll go back to what your earlier question was. What? Because again, I've got a 30 year uh, history of trying this and it not working. So what was different? And for me, it had to be getting rid of the sugar. I found a community where I did not feel alone and isolated, where I felt understood and held, and that was critical. And then I had to do the work to figure out why I ate to start with and come up with another way of coping because mine was emotional eating, right? And then come up with another way of coping, which you know involved me building a relationship with my parts so that they trusted me. It also involved like, more, you know, finding other avenues, like getting in the bathtub every night, you know, like locking myself in the bathtub worked beautifully. And still to this day, it's not one of my number one pleasures. So I had to develop other habits and other ways of coping um, and finding a support group, finding, well, not finding a support group, but finding support that would help me on my journey. And so those were the, that's what the difference was. And so if I were talking to Laura, from, you know, 2016, this time of the year, 2016, I would have just, cause I would have just been fat shamed on the plane. I'm going to about to go to the doctor next month and weigh 302 pounds. I would say, baby girl, I am one more time. Just, oh, I'm going to cry. I've got a part that's going to cry one more time. You have no idea. You have no idea what's on the other side that I can tell you, and you're not gonna like it, you're gonna have to give up the sugar, you're gonna find some support, and you're gonna have to do the inner work. And that's, but hold on tight, because you can't even imagine what's on the other side. So, so true, so true. I mean, that's, that's it right there. We could never have imagined no. what life could be like today. Yeah. But we had to hang in there. That's oh, right. I love that. And I love her for trying one more time because yeah. we were convinced we would just die this way. And we knew it would be sooner than later, right? Because our health had already like taken a tanking for 10 years. So yeah, hold on one more time. Keep mm -hmm. trying. I think that would be, you know, another one is just like, keep trying, never give up. Never, never, never quit. Yeah, that's right. Clarissa, Clarissa calls it be a chronic never giver upper. I like it. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right.
Awesome. Well, thank you again so very much for being here with me today, sharing your story, spreading hope, and 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 just letting everybody know just, you know, there is something on the other side of this. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Just never quit. That's it. Never quit. You are worth it and never quit. Yeah. Thank and you. if I always used to say at the beginning, like probably the first year and a half, two years, I'd be like, if I can do this, anybody can do this. Cause I had tried and failed so many times. That would be the other thing I would say, if I can do this, anybody can, because it was, a, it was a long haul. You are worth it. Keep after it. I am so yeah. grateful at 55 to actually be happy for the first time in my life. Mm. Yes. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. If you like what you heard today, please remember to like comment, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching.